Hello, yes, and welcome to the Irish Football Fan TV Premier Division show for this week with myself, Jar Brown, and Gary Swain. We're going to look back on the action from the weekend just gone by that included two Dublin derbies and a couple of crucial wins, in particular for Finn Harps on Sunday. And we'll also look ahead to what is also going to be a busy week for Irish sides in Europe with Derry, Bowles, and Shamrock Rovers all participating in Europa League qualifiers over the next couple of days. Gary, how is all with yourself? Are you all prepared for oh. Ron Francis, which is due to arrive in only a matter of minutes, really, at this stage? Yeah, yeah, all well. That's... Yeah, good to hear. Just so that you know, we are recording this show on Monday evening, so just before Derry, the first of the three Irish sides, uh, kick off in action tomorrow evening. We'll start with, I suppose, with the Dublin Derby games over the, the weekend. The first of them was in Tallis Stadium on Friday night. Uh, Shamrock Rovers versus Shelburne. Paul was at this game. It was live on RG2. Um, I was at a game myself, so I just watched back the highlights there in Soccer Republic. Overall, it seemed a, a pretty fair result. Both teams had their decent, fair chance amount of chances without either team creating any major guilt uh, edge opportunities. Yeah, I, I think that's fair commentary. I actually watched it in RT and uh, I was impressed with Shells. I mean, yeah, I agree. I think a draw was a fair result. I think Shells deserved a draw. They could have won it. Jace Kabaya nearly won it and laid on. But, um, I mean, Rovers probably had had more of the possession, more of the territory, but they, they, they didn't do enough. They, they didn't do enough for me to deserve to win the game. And uh, I was very impressed with Shells. And, uh I thought they were well worth the point. Yes, it had been a, of a frustration period over the last couple of weeks for Shamrock Rovers. He touched on the show last week that performance-wise, you haven't maybe been overly impressed with them. And now, obviously, the last two results will add more frustration for them, uh, drawing games nil-nil against Shelburne and St. Pat's. And it definitely has now opened the door back open for the chasing pack. It has. You know, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I think most people were reckoning the league was over and if Shamrock Rovers could have set. I, I certainly mentioned the possibility, maybe I put the, the jinx on them, of breaking the record for wins from both the start of the season and uh, the all-time uh, league record. And, uh, well, Bose still hold that, actually, because the Pats took care of that. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, they, they, they struggled... They, they've gone two games now without scoring. The Pats game, they'll probably feel there was a lot of bad luck because they absolutely dominated the game. Um, Shelburne, they didn't have the same dominance. I mean, Shelburne were well in the game. Shelburne defended well, but they also caused problems for overs. And, uh, yeah, I think in this case, I don't think anyone can argue that Shelburne were well worth the point. Yeah, and probably even as to... Uh, wor- worries and concern for Shamrock Rovers these two uh, frustrating nil-nil draws just before the European campaign obviously they had a great run in Europe last year knocking out Brand from Norway and they got one over Apoel Limassol in the first leg before only losing out an extra time in Cyprus so it will m- slightly affect their confidence ahead of their game against Ives from Finland on Thursday night Yeah it's, it's, it probably will um, I've actually I, I mean obviously look I support all our clubs in Europe and wish the three of them the best. I, I have high hopes for Rovers. Um, they are at home. They're in, they're still in good form. I mean, even if they haven't, I mean, they haven't lost a game for going back. Uh, I don't know when their last defeat was actually, but um, it was well back last year and, and they did really well in Europe last year. So um, I, I think they've got a, a very good chance against the team, which is probably just mid table in Finland. I mean, it's not one of the, they're not having a particularly spectacular season. And uh, I think Rovers are currently the best team in, in in our league at the moment. And despite a couple of blanks, I think they have um, they have a great chance of going through. And I actually fancy them on Thursday night. I, I, I really do think they'll win and I really hope they do. Because I, I, I think Europe is actually... A great showcase for our league and shows shows where we stand against against other leagues, and uh, fingers crossed. So it's it's come on Rovers definitely on Thursday night. Yeah, definitely having home advantage and the fact they don't have to travel will be a big coup for them. And just going back to your point, I think off the top of my head, their last league defeat I think was at Oriel Park last September the night Dundalk clinched the league. So we're talking about maybe 15, 16 league games now. They are unbeaten. To touch on it from a Shelburne point of view. 
Paul obviously we mentioned was at the game on Friday night, Shelburne fan covering the game for the channel. I think he would have been pretty happy with that uh, point on Friday night if you'd offered them before a ball was kicked Friday, they would have taken that. As you mentioned, Jacob A has had that chance towards the end, even um, who was it in the first half, Darrell or Dale Rooney, like if he probably should have pulled the ball back into the box instead of trying to score from an acute angle. It's a pretty decent point for them, and they're in that kind of category of teams where they're not far off Europe, but they still have to look over their shoulder for a potential relegation playoff. Yeah, it's um, we can maybe, I don't know, we can talk about the table at any stage, but I think there are a whole load of teams. Um, and you could even you could even mention Dundalk in this, but I don't think that's realistic, frankly. But there's a whole load of teams anywhere, anyone really except possibly Cork and Finn Harps. And, well, maybe even, but because um, there's only four points in it. But any of the teams on 11 points and up would have half an eye on Europe and half an eye on being dragged into the relegation battle. And I think there's nobody has, I suppose, put a run together of, of those teams. If anything, it's the, the team on, on 12 points, actually, Sligo, that have been the most impressive. But there's none of them. Uh, they've, they've all been hot and cold, I think. You can talk about Shells, you can talk about Pats, you can talk about Waterford. Um, I mean, you can make a case for them possibly being in Europe and you can make a case for them being dragged into the relegation battle. And and depending on their results, you know, it's... Um, I mean, Shells will be coming off Friday night on a real high. Uh, some of the others will be thinking, God, Cork, if Cork and Harps got a couple of wins or one of them, we'd be in right trouble. So um, it, I, we've said it a few times. I've said it. It's a short season. It's only 18 games each. and. Uh, Every match is going to matter, and absolutely everything is up for grabs. And uh, there won't be any at this stage boring end of season uh, matches. So um, Europe is there. The league is definitely on the line, and uh, the relegation battle is incredibly tight. There's only one goal in it at the moment at the bottom. Yeah, going into the second half of the season or second series of games, like the league is actually perfectly poised. I think this weekend's results just from a neutral point of view, was probably exactly what the league could have done with. Like, in terms of, like, Shelburne there, they're in that kind of category themselves. Waterford, Derry, Pats, there are will be eyeing Europe. They just seem to be struggling to find that consistency. And I think them four teams really do need to start to up their game a little bit in terms of that aspect because Dundalk, you still would fancy them just purely on their past history of the last couple of years that they will still secure a European spot. And Sligo are just a team on savage run with serious momentum at the moment and nothing looks like it's going to stop them and they look a good bet but then with the four teams the evidence so far from the first four or five games since we came back is I don't really see anything suggest that they are going to hit a consistent run of form I know myself and being a Pats fan it's the same thing same year on year on we could have been having this conversation two or three years ago and we'd be seeing the same things about Pats good and bad from one week to the other but we'll touch on and we'll move to the other Dublin derby Bowles versus uh, St. Pat's from Day Mount on Saturday. And we mentioned the tight race is back on. And Bowles also deserve credit for this. It's not just because Shamrock Rovers have dropped points the last couple of weeks. It's because Bohemians, along with Sligo Rovers, have been excellent since the league has resumed. Deserve 2-0 victory against uh, Pat's on Saturday. Both goals come in the first half. Obviously, the first goal, Anto Breson, didn't mean it. Got caught up in the wind. Called out Brendan Clark. Um, Andre Wright there with the second goal from the corner. And the second half, Pats did play a little bit better. They did see more of the ball, but like both were still such a threat in the counter attack. And you know, Keith Long said in his post match interview, they probably could have added more goals. Yeah, yeah, definitely, Jared. I think it's very balanced to you to say it. Um, but yeah, Bowles, there was no question they deserve to win. I think you would have to be ardent, dyed in the wool, red and white, to give any argument that Pats deserved anything out of the game. Yeah, uh, and to Breslin's, I, he might claim it was a shot, but certainly it looked to me like it really caught a gust of wind. Um, it looked like a cross. Um, Brendan Clark probably won't be too happy with it either. Um, so Andre Wright it was a fantastic header. He is actually some player. He's having some yeah. season. It was a really powerful header. Great goal. Great corner from Keith Ward, who played. Um, he played really well as well, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, and both, as you said, they could have had a couple more. Chris Twardick, um, 
nailed on penalty for me. I'm sure he's pretty livid. It was a free out given against him. Oh, yeah, I found anyway. that strange one even, to be honest, as well myself. I thought when I first when I was watching the game on the stream on Saturday and seeing Rory Feet go down, like, this is a definite penalty. I was like, oh my God, like the, this is just going to end up being an annihilation because that could have potentially put them three nil up. I couldn't believe the referee appointed for the way, thankfully, that he did, but like, it still made no difference. And as you touched on there, the likes of Keith Ward and Tardek were absolutely brilliant on Saturday. Like Tardek should have scored a couple of minutes later. Like the crossbar in Damon Park is probably still shaking two days later. Yeah, it was a great effort, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah he's some player as well. I mean, well, I, I, I'll give you an example. I, I, I looked at the Bohemian substitutes for Saturday. If James Talbot, goalkeeper, who was arguably, if not even arguably, the best keeper in the league last season, and you Danny Mandrew, who was arguably one of the top players in the league, he was one of the top players in the league, it only gets even an argument, he's in the Irish under-21 squads. And you've Dinny Corcoran, fantastic striker, the three of them on the bench. And I mean, we've said it, the Bulls have, they have some side and they, they have some squad. And uh, yeah, they, they are in this title race, um, no question about it. Yeah, it sets things up perfectly now when you even look at the fixture list. Their next game is away in Tala against Shamrock Rovers, like that bit early for a title this year, but it's definitely going to be a huge significance in the destiny of the title. And they would also feel, from their point of view, they've been known to have the upper hand on Shamrock Rovers, but that tide has now turned in the last three or four meetings. I think it's it's three victories on the bounce now for Shamrock Rovers. So both will feel, hold on a second, now we're due a victory here. They will. I mean, they they certainly had quite a few wins in a row which were probably seen as being against the odds in, in both Daily Mount and Tala. But as you said, they suffered a heartbreaking defeat on the first day, the opening day of the season, the injury time goal and the cup semi-final last year will will it, it definitely really hurt. It hurt both. I mean, and especially as that one they were they were both actually both those defeats were in Daily Mount. But they're not going to be afraid to come to Tala on Saturday week and uh, it's going to be some game. And uh, yeah, maybe it's too early to be a title decider. I think if Rovers were to win, I think stretch the gap out to five points, would be a big ask for Bose to haul them in. Um, if Bose were to win, I mean, it would definitely be advantage Bose and putting incredible pressure on Shamrock Rovers. Uh, it'll be some game. Yeah, I honestly cannot wait for it. And of course, sandwich in between them two Ireland matches the start of September. So the first couple of days of September, there's so much to look forward to from an Irish football point of view. Before all that, they've got a cup game against Cabin TV on Monday. And even before that, they have another cup game, European tie, Hungarian opposition for them. Obviously, this would have been under normal circumstances. It would have been great balls and excitement. Day on Power Coast in a European game. Balls back in Europe for the first time in nearly a decade. But obviously, circumstances are different. Well, um, how would you rate their chances? I know you looked up and you've um, kept an eye on how the Hungarian side's form is. Like, they've always had decent pedigree Hungarian clubs in Europe. They have. I mean, uh, Fervar have only played two league games so far and they've drawn both of them, um, 3-3 and 1-1. So, there's certainly, there's goals in them and they concede goals. Um, I mean, in fairness, you would have to say the Hungarian league is of a higher standard of our league. So I think, and with home advantage, you have to say Fehavar will be favourites. But, I mean, Bowes are in flying form and uh, they certainly have a chance on Thursday. Um, if the, the, the home side can concede goals, it, it's quite a shame that they don't get a home leg. It's, it's also the 50th anniversary of Bowes actually qualifying for Europe. They first played in 1970 against Gotvaldov from the, the, well, I think it's what's now in the Czech Republic, um, uh, the old Czechoslovakia um, and they've had many appearances in Europe over that 50 years um, it's a real shame there isn't a game in Daily Mount Park with with fans but unfortunately in this this is the world we live in today with COVID-19 etc um, I'm sure there'll be lots of Bose fans and lots of League of Ireland fans tuning in, it's great that there's a stream available um, and they definitely they have a chance on Thursday. Um, I would make fair of our favourites, just even based on the standard of the league. And uh, but you never know. And Bose have to have a chance. 
Yeah, knockout football, anything can happen. You know, penalties and shoot penalty, or extra time and penalty shoot possibilities. All bets are really on for this game. And I suppose from a crowd point of view, like the way things are looking at the moment, there's a good chance of a, a total class balls will be back in Europe in 2021. So hopefully by then, a couple of fans will be allowed back into matches. Just briefly before we finish on this game, obviously to talk about from a St. Pat's point of view, that's I really kind of want to because there wasn't too many pulses. From the game, they're the only Premier Division side now as well, along with Waterford actually, that aren't in action now this weekend in the FAI Cup. So they got a two-week break and I'm, I'm pretty sure Stephen O'Donnell will have plenty of time to, I suppose, mull over this game before they actually play Waterford in their next league match. Yeah, and uh, well, it's a classic game. I mean, it's two teams that, uh, as we were saying, will have an eye over their shoulder on the, the bottom two, but also have an eye still on the top four. I know Waterford came to Inchi Core on the opening night and uh, probably a bit of a smash and grab, actually, it was, it was, but um, pulled off a bit of a surprise win. Um, yeah, both teams have the two weeks off to prepare for the game. It, it'll, it'll probably say a lot. I mean, the winners will certainly be saying, yeah, we can get Europe, and the losers will be saying, hmm, they'll be looking for the Finn Harps and Cork City results. Um, yeah. Maybe it'll be a draw. Who knows? It's uh, they're very they're getting very tough get tough to call. Actually, all this um, bundle of teams in the in the middle of the table, all of those at the moment on eleven points. Because uh, as you say, Jared, there's no consistency. And how do you predict this? Yeah, as well. Of course, there's no love loss between these two clubs as well. Water for the Pats, given obviously off the field issues from last year as well. So that only just add to the fixture. So we have to touch on as well, uh, it brings us on nicely to Dundalk versus Saigon. Dundalk, it's been an eventful couple of days for them. It's really been a horrible, really, couple of days, to be brutally honest. It's been not the ideal um, start for them. They're the only team now since the league resumed at the end of July that haven't won a game. Another bad defeat against Sligo 3-1. This course coming off the back of that defeat in the Champions League qualifier and Vinnie Pert losing his job. Just to kind of start and to look back on that game first, because it was on RT last Wednesday, I thought the scoreline was really harsh. I thought the actual, I know they came in for a good bit of criticism. Like I was listening to Dan McDonald and Johnny Ward, and they kind of very kind of laid on them on, on LOI Weekly. But I thought they were really unlucky. Like they gave away a goal, a scrappy goal just before half time, a little bit against run of play. You know, Michael Duffy nearly scores from a cute angle in the second half. Pat Hoban hits the post, and then he just gave away two goals towards the end. I actually thought they played quite well. and like if they if they had brought the game to extra time and they looked like at one stage in the second half they might do and go on and achieve, they wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been unjustice or it wouldn't have been unfair. Sorry. No, I, yeah, I mean it certainly wasn't a three nil game. I mean you look at the scoreline and you say three nil and you say it appears John Dock were hammered. They weren't, as you said. The the opening goal it did come against the runner play, but it was it was a disastrous um, goal to concede from a Dundalk point of view. Um, it, it was poor defensively. Yeah, they had chances to equalise. If they had equalised, who knows what would have happened. I mean, and, and the, the second and third goals came when at the end when Dundalk were just chasing the game from caution to the win. So, again, it didn't look too good defensively, but I, I wouldn't be too worried. Look, you may as well lose 3-0 as 1-0. So, you had to chase the game at that stage. Um I don't think Vinny lost his job for the just on the European game. I mean, look, there's all sorts of stories coming out of Dundalk, so I don't know what we can say or even speculate on. Um, but certainly things things don't look right. They don't look like the Dundalk. They're certainly not the Dundalk of last season or of the earlier times. I mean, they're they're they look a bit of a mess. I mean, frankly. Um, and they were shocking on Saturday night. I mean, whatever about the European game. And I suppose you, you could argue they had a right go at Sligo and they missed a penalty and they could have equalised and all that. But even having said that, I mean, it's not it's not the Dundalk we know. And uh, and I mean, these they haven't become bad players overnight, but it's uh, there does seem to be something wrong there. And it's, it's a tough job for... Um, well, whoever comes comes in, and we're hearing it's um, well as of the moment, it's uh, this Italian guy Giovanni Bagnoli, or maybe Joe, you can have a better goal pronouncing pronouncing it. I'm than not me. even going. To, I'm just going to leave okay. it at that. If, if a man of your experience can't pronounce it, 
uh, a new kid in the block like me certainly won't be able to. But just as I touched on there, like he's a, he's a new name to me, never mind even just trying to pronounce his name. Like I'm looking at his pedigree and CV, nothing really majorly stands out. Is he someone that you would have been familiar and would have heard of prior to this morning? No, I, I, I honestly never, I'd never heard of him, Ger, and uh, I, I haven't even seen anyone yet. Um, there's lots of comments on Twitter and everything like that and comments about him. I haven't even anyone say, oh, yeah, we know him well and all this, and how come you don't know him? From, well, I know he he ran the Milan Academy, and he was recently in, in the States in the New York Academy, sorry, Milan Summer Camps, I believe, and uh, he was running this for youth players, so that's possibly where he came to the attention of the, the Dundalk owners, because he obviously made an impression with them. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a tough job. Um, I think he's only an interim appointment till the end of the season is what uh, I believe the speculation is. And I, I should point out, actually, he he hasn't officially got the job yet. So um Possibly we we'll, we could all be made fools of out of this one as well, but um, it does seem there seems to be very informed speculation from very um, trustworthy sources in Dundalk that he is getting the job. So we'll take that at face value. I mean, there's quite a challenge there for Dundalk because there were only there were only three points, they're two points ahead of Sligo now, and they're they're only three points ahead of the the whole clatter of clubs on eleven, and. Uh, I mean, I saw some disastrous predictions, even from a couple of Dundalk fans saying we could get dragged into the relegation battle. Now, I don't think that's realistic um, at all. And I still expect Dundalk to comfortably enough end up in Europe in the end. But um, certainly there'll have to be, because I mean, Dundalk have to be in Europe. I mean, the club they have, the players they have, the budget they have, they have to be qualifying for Europe every year. And uh, so there, there will be there will be quite a bit of pressure on them to um, to deliver. Yeah, I think like a, a Europa League spot, like finishing top four, is really the minimum of their requirements given the expectations and obviously their past history. Just in terms of Finney Perth, Zach, I know you're saying it hasn't just come off the back of the the European one. I know a lot of people are pointing well, that's them out of the Champions League. The league is gone. Maybe the cup doesn't have much value for them. I still was a little bit surprised because I think the Europa League, they go into that competition now. And obviously, like I wasn't confident for them on Wednesday night because of the form. And I still wouldn't be confident dropping into the Europa League because of the form. But it is an opportunity for them to, to potentially do something. I know when they dropped down into it last year, they got well beaten by Slovan, uh, Bratislava. But like they went on to reach the group stages and were very competitive in it. So they were up against good opposition. But yeah, it, it is worrying. Like, it's, mad to think like obviously now with Finn Harris winning yesterday they're the only team that hasn't won since we started back up after uh, COVID like it's just mad for a team of their their quality and, and like you know you apart from obviously being water from the cup like you, you that really would want to start turning around and picking it up quite soon because you mentioned they're only three points ahead of that cluster of teams on 11 and now just two points ahead of the team that bet them on Saturday Sliger Rovers who you know they've clicked 12 points it's all come since the restart they've been excellent over the last a uh, couple of weeks, and also now Junior is, is settled in, and he got a goal as well on Saturday night. Yeah, he did. He got the the, the third goal. He uh, a fine header past um, Gary Rogers from a David Cawley free kick, and he scored a lot of goals for Derry. It was a great signing for Sligo. Um, yeah, Sligo been really impressive. It, it's strange, really. They've had four wins since lockdown, and and then got hammered three nil in Cork. So, um, but yeah, Sligo have been really impressive. Um, Ronan Coughlin played very well Ryan De Vries got a goal as well um, he's been a very impressive player for them uh, great free kick from Regan Donlan um, for the first goal and uh, they, they were fully deserved winners I mean I know Dundalk in the first half will probably feel they were unlucky to go in behind I mean the, a great save actually from Ed McGinty from Pat Huben's penalty but I mean Dundalk missed a penalty they had a lot of other chances they had a lot of possession a lot of territory but I mean Sligo came out in the second half and that, that quick goal from Ryan De Reason, I think that effectively finished the game and uh, fair play to Sligo um, they're, they're one of the teams I think coming out of lockdown would have been very concerned about relegation because as you said they had no points no wins but um not now. Four wins out of five, and uh, yeah, they are flying. 
Yeah, I suppose the only thing that might point was that the last game before the lockdown, they were they played quite well and got two goals at home against Shamrock Rovers. So they did show some sort of glimpses from that, but it's been a, a huge, huge improvement. They've gone like from, you know, we didn't talk about the start of the season, it's like if they avoided a relegation playoff, they've been doing well. It's now like being serious contenders for European football. So Liam Buckley, I think, deserves great credit there. And I think in general, like Liam Buckley's done a very good job last season as well. I thought they'd done very well to hold their own league and to get to a cup semi final. Considering that again, like last season, going into last season, a lot of people have felt they were kind of a club and maybe a little bit on the decline and could get called out. But you know, they are doing it's, and it's great to see as well because they are a big football town up there in the northwest, and it's nice to see another regional regional club in the Premier Division, I suppose, as such. Um, we'll touch on the last two remaining games Friday night. Derry got a good victory against Cork, they came from behind to win this game, but it was um richly deserved. Obviously, they've been pretty frustrated with the goal they gave away. Peter Cherry won't really want to look back on it um, too much to free kick Kevin O'Connor. In the end, I suppose, decent finish um, from Joseph Walla. But they they responded really, really well after that goal. That goal came early on. Like They could have easily gone into the break level and it paid off them in the second half. But we talk about goalkeeping errors and defensive errors. Like Cork didn't help themselves. I think um, Mark McNulty certainly won't really want to look back on the first goal, possibly even the second goal, and then the last goal then to the round it off. It all led from a poor clearance from Kevin O'Connor that started it off. Yeah, Ger, I I wasn't that impressed with them in the first half. I I thought Cork uh, Cork did well in in the first half. I I think Derry would have been very unhappy going off at half time, and uh, you're thinking. They were probably looking over their shoulder, thinking, "God, we could be in a relegation mix." Um, certainly, I think Declan Devine gave them quite a telling off at halftime because they they certainly came out and uh, all guns blazing in the second half, and they got the two goals within a minute. Yeah, I mean, people watched the show last week. I was singing the praises of Mark McNulty. He's going to be forty in October. He had a fantastic game against Sligo. Um, yeah, you mentioned Peter Cherry, who who wasn't who's another fantastic keeper actually, but he wasn't he wasn't good for the goal. Yeah, Mark McNulty would be very disappointed watching back the the first goal. Um, Walt Fregera took it took it well, but McNulty should have dealt with it. Um, second goal came within a minute, and you kind of think, and yeah, Derry pretty much go on and win it then. Yeah, and I know the third goal, the insurance goal, didn't come to right at the end. But um, yeah, a game of two halves for me, really. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a tough second half of the season for Cork. I mean, they had they had a couple of good wins home to Longford in the cup and and against Sligo. But um, some massive games coming up: a trip to Talca to face Shells next. Well, they, they have Shamrock Rovers in the FEI Cup first, but in the league, there'll be a crucial game in Talca. And yeah, that's what's talking about is right to play Shelburne because Shells already went to turn across and one nil. And just on Peter Cherry, like he did make a mistake for that first goal, but boy, did he redeem himself with a brilliant one handed save from Simpson's header in the second half. And the game was at 2 1, so that was absolutely vital. From a dairy point of view, it's a busy week coming up uh, for them. They're in Drotada for the FBI Cup on Saturday, but before that, they have a trip out in Eastern Europe. They're in Lithuania tomorrow night. Um, it's their first European adventure since 2018. Would you be confident of them having a good run? Yeah, I actually, I I have high hopes for Derry in this game. Um, the the Lithuanian cr- crowd. I was hoping you'd you'd help me out with the pronunciation. Ritter, or Ritter, or anyway, sorry, I'm probably murdering that again. Take a very much back, Stephen. It comes to pronunciations this evening. Okay, <laughs> so they're actually um the bottom of the Lithuanian league, and uh, they're really struggling. They're having an awful season, and. Uh, they um they have to be very even though Derry are away, um they have to be they have to be very beatable and uh, so maybe if you're watching this afterwards I you could make a, a fool out of me again but um I, I quite fancy Derry for this for this tie, uh, yeah they would have preferred to have them in the Brandywell but um given the options they had and being unseeded I think it's it's a very good draw for Derry and. Uh, I think they've got a great chance, and and that stream is available as well. Um, people are watching this on Tuesday morning. You can uh, you can buy a stream for that game for at, at five o'clock on Tuesday. Yeah, so hopefully Derry can get the victory on Tuesday night. That can kind of 
let the let the platforms will hopefully be a good week for to follow then Thursday night for Bowles and for Shamrock Rovers. Just briefly as well, I just want to touch on Cork because I was um I was getting a roundup of the results from Friday night after the Athlone Shamrock Rovers two match on Friday night, and I was talking to a few people from Athlone. Some were suggesting would um Neil Fenn want to be looking over his shoulder a small bit in terms of his days being numbered in Cork. I myself personally disagree. I think Cork realise, you know, that this is kind of going to take a while. This is going to be a long term project and it could take, you know, maybe two years, three years to get them back where they are and they're going to be patient with Neil Finn. Would you hold the same view as myself or would you think that he could be someone that could be in danger of getting the sack? I don't think in the near term. Now I did hear rumblings, let's say, before the, the Longford game, but um I think he should be given time. I mean it's uh, but look, Cork have the the biggest biggest support still in the league, and uh, they're a pretty demanding bunch down in Turner's Cross. And I mean, they got rid of John Caulfield not long after he won the league. So um, I, I I don't think it's in it's in the near term. But I think if results don't improve, and particularly if Finn Harps start picking up points, um, he could be under pressure. Um, in, in a few weeks' time, maybe. I, I don't think the next couple of games... I mean, they, they've got to go to Tala in the FAI Cup. I, I think they're on a hiding to nothing in that. I mean, even if Shamrock Rovers rotate the squad, which I would expect they will do, given they've got Europe and they've got the Bose game and they've got the Cup tie in between, I would still expect Shamrock Rovers to have too much in the Cup. Um, but Cork would certainly be targeting getting something out of the Shelburne game. And... They won't be, I, I think, is a third or fourth game in. They they, they go to, to Finn Park, they face Finn Harps. Um, I'm not sure if that's late in September or early October, but that will be coming up soon enough as well. That's going to be an absolutely massive game. And, uh, yeah, maybe after that game we'll take stock, but who knows, City could get a string a couple of wins together and all will be rosy on Lee's side then. Yeah, even if it's... I could probably say with confidence even at the moment that game in Finn Park in a couple of weeks' time already has just got relegation six pointer written all over. That could be absolutely massive in the tournament who finishes ten to ninth in the Premier Division for this season. And that brings us on nicely then to our last game, which of course involves Finn Harris. And I don't mean any disservice here whatsoever at all towards Waterford fans, but this was the result I was absolutely craving for. I think the league craved for because I think if Finn Harris had lost this game, you would have kind of felt right. That's kind of the automatic relegation and playoff spots kind of, I wouldn't say decided, but you kind of feel it's inevitable. It's certainly shot a boost into it, the league. And as we now, as we touched on earlier, everything is up for grabs going into the second half season. It couldn't be even more poised. This was a crazy, crazy game. Um, five goals, four of them didn't come until I think from the 82nd minute onwards. Again, a couple of juvias goalkeeping. I don't think uh, Mark McGinley will be too happy with the two goals. He can see that. Waterford as well, their uh, goalkeeper Brian Murphy, he'd be pretty annoyed with Finn Harris' first goal, Dave Webster's goal, and even probably the um, the winning goal as well by uh, Adrian De- Delap. Like, fairness, it was, it was a good save, It was, uh, um, but it was just unfortunate he just had to palm it right down the middle into the path of Adrian Delap. It's a long trip from Bay Buffet to Waterford, but I'm sure the journey home didn't seem that long or didn't bother Ollie Horgan one bit. No, it was a, a massive win, massive, massive win for Finn Harps. I think Ollie even admitted afterwards they were probably a little bit lucky to win, but they certainly deserved a draw, and uh, they've had very little luck this season, so they'll probably feel, and I'm sure Ollie does feel, they, they deserved it. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a good day for goalkeepers. It was actually Ty grinding goal for Waterford. Uh, Brian Murphy, I think, is oh, injured. Got injured a couple of weeks ago, but um, yeah, he... Well, what can you say? I mean, we'll start off with Ali Coote. It was a, a, a bit tough on McGinley for the first one. It, got, it took a wicked deflection. Um, I think Ali Coote's been credited with the goal because his shot was on target, but I think it was going in the other side of the goal and might have saved it. I think McGinley was already going down. Um, Waterford won up. It looked pretty run-of-the-mill win for Waterford at that stage. Uh corner kick comes in in the 82nd minute as you said and uh, a tie grind should have done better it went over his head and Dave Webster headed it in and even then you're thinking right decent point for Finn Harps 
Watford go up the, the other end. Michael O'Connor flicks it on. John Martin finishes. Yeah, maybe McGinley could have done better. It's good, good, good finish too, though. Um, low hard shot. And then you're thinking, God, typical Finn Harps. God, I mean, and I think had Finn Harps lost a game 2-1 in that circumstances, you would have said, Jesus, oh, I mean, it must have been gut-wrenching for the Harps fans. Uh, now, Oli will also claim the credit for the substitutions because, um, okay. yeah, Alexander Cogler and Adrian Delap came off the bench and uh, the, the two of them got the, well, they set each other up for the two goals. And uh, a fantastic header from Alexander Cogler. And uh, yeah, a good, good finish from Cogler set up the lap in the, the 90th minute. Massive win for Finn Harps. Absolutely. And look, they're a fantastic club. Great fans. I'm absolutely delighted for them. Um, I also feel for Waterford because I think had they won the game, they would certainly have been looking. They'd be level with Dundalk. They would have been looking at Europe. Um, they actually could have gone third with a huge win. I don't think that was ever realistic, but they certainly would have gone level with Dundalk. And uh, now they're kind of looking over their shoulder. Um, massive, massive boost, as I said, for Finn Harps. It's, uh, it was a badly needed win. They hadn't won, as you said, Jerry, since the first day of the season. Um, and they didn't look like scoring too many goals. And suddenly they get three in eight minutes. So it's... Um, it's huge, and as you said, it's fantastic for the league. It really tightens things up. And, and as a neutral, I think it's it's great. It's going to be um, some relegation battle, but it's it's going to be very hard on on who goes down. And uh, I'm sure the first division clubs will be looking and saying, "I hope it's not Finn Harps in the playoff." No, they have an unbelievable record in that playoff. I think they've 2015, 17. And I'm oh, sorry, 15, 18, and last or 19, winning all three of them was, was brilliant. Of course, two of them occasions was against your own Limerick. So you well, know all about how good they I can know be in that all, play all, all, I know all about them, Ger, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry, Gary. <laughs> but yeah, just uh, going back to that point, I think it's absolutely brilliant heading into the second series of matches, the last nine games, the running, squeaky bum time, as Al Ferguson would say, after all the off the field issues and the months and weeks of games, to have an absolutely brilliantly poised. Um, first Premier Division and even the First Division, which we'll touch on on that show as well, I think is absolutely brilliant and it's great to see. And it's just going to add to the excitement levels. And to touch on like the next round of series of games, that Bowls Rovers game, like you know, there's going to be a lot of interest now. You can see there's been great viewerships for, for that stream and all the games as well. It's, it's exactly what you want to see. Just briefly as well, from a Waterford point of view, do you think there's maybe a little bit of a psychological hangover from that Dundalk game because they were tuning up with little or no time left, only single digits of uh, figure in terms of minutes left, and they obviously conceded two goals and drew that game and obviously then went on and conceded the last-minute goal as well against Sligo and now have also conceded two late goals against uh, Finn Harp. So there is seems to be a little bit of an issue in terms of Waterford just finishing out the games and staying strong until the 90 minutes are up. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, in Sligo they were actually winning. I think until the seventy-seventh minute, as you say, they lost it. The two goals in Dundalk in the last seven or eight minutes, and and they actually could have lost that game. I think if Dundalk in another three or four minutes, they'd have beaten them and even hit the bar at two-two as well. Um, yeah, so many that, that's um, seven goals they've conceded in the last quarter of an hour of their last three games. You got a question? Is is I don't know what it is. Is it fitness? Is it concentration? Um, it's not. It's not a good sign. I mean, I I was looking even just a week ago. I was actually out in Bray um, at a match, and I was talking to a couple of people when they were tuning up in uh, in Dundalk, and were saying, "Wow!" And they've really got it together, and really saying Waterford could really be in Europe. Now they could still be in Europe despite these results. But you're thinking two up in Dundalk, back match to come in Sligo home game against Finn Harps, they they were looking really good. And suddenly, they concede the two goals against Dundalk. I know they were down to 10 men, and then they lose in Sligo. They they lose at home to Finn Harps. And now they're saying we're four points ahead of Finn Harps and four points ahead of um, Cork City. And they still have to go to both of those teams. They go to Finn Harps on the last day of the season. Wow. Um, 
I think Waterford, of all the teams at 11 points, I think Waterford will probably now be the most concerned about the relegation battle. But again, look, if they beat Pats in a couple of weeks' time, they'll be back on and looking at Europe and be Pats looking over their shoulders. So who knows? Yeah, I think probably the two-week break, I think they'll actually be delighted to that because given everything that's happened over the last seven or eight days and they probably should have taken... You know, at least seven points from them three games and end up only taking one. I think a bit of a break and just to kind of get away and clear the heads and stuff like that could be just exactly what they need and come back refreshed and fully focused for that St. Pat's game, which uh, might not be the best thing from a St. Pat's point of view. But yeah, that obviously is going to be an an important game in terms of, you know, European places or, as you mentioned as well, potentially being sucked into a relegation battle. That's where we're going to leave it for our Premier Division show here on Irish Football Fan TV. Obviously, we'll have our first division show coming up um, as well. Come out the channel. We obviously have all the interviews as well with Stephen Kenny's squad announcement. They went out yesterday as well. Uh, Gary, thanks very much for joining me. Of course, and I'll see you now for the first division show as well. Thanks, Joe. All right, uh, keep tuned here on the channel. Of course, we'll have hopefully loads of reaction from this weekend's FBI Cup games with post-match interviews and reaction. Thanks very much for tuning in and I hope you're all keeping safe out there.